Hey, I'm really excited about your response to this series on James. To be honest, uh, it's, it's something that I have uh, taken as somewhat uh, in terms of uh, trying to be in submission to, not trying, well, my elders might say trying, uh, in, in submission to our elders' leadership and input that they give and uh, also other mentors that I have in my life. So uh, it's a different style of preaching. It's a different way to approach and prepare, and uh, it's just pretty amazing that I've heard some uh, just genuine excitement about approaching uh, the book of James and looking at it uh, in a systematic way. But, uh, it, you know, I don't necessarily leave my preaching style uh, in the dust, but I, I am excited about what this is communicating to us. So um, thank you, and I'd love to hear back from you. In any time, I, I would use that as an opportunity to say this, any time that um, I'm on a series or, or um, preaching through something, or whether it's topical or, or now through a book or, or thematical, but I, I love to hear from you, uh, whether that is you have concerns or uh, encouragement or, um, you know, just input or I, I really don't hear enough from you and I don't know what that's about. It's been, you know, I've been here 13 years now and uh, I still I have not found a way to encourage you enough to say, I'd like to hear from you, whether it's an email, a phone call, a visit. Uh, if you want me to take in more of what you're saying right after the service is probably not the best time. As I, I, you know, there's something in me that's kind of gone or deadened at that point, but really do en encourage you to, to give us feedback on how, on how uh, the, you're hearing the messages and what's speaking to you. So thank you for speaking this week. Um, you know, obviously in church, and there's a lot made about reading the Bible, right? If you, if probably one of the first messages you get when you engage church life is that you should read the Bible. Uh, if you think about from the time that you went to your first vacation Bible school, and I went to uh, my first BBS, my neighbors at Ridgecrest uh, Baptist Church on a little highway just leaving town. And, um, I remember that was one of the things that they talked about. Uh, apart from uh, hanging out with friends, making some things out of popsicle sticks, and eating fun food, uh, I remember them talking about the importance of the Bible. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, I, I wish I had time to uh, do the research, but there's thousands of Bible reading apps available and devotionals. I mean, golly, everybody, especially now that you can just you can write a devotional yourself, and if if they'll approve it on you version, you can get it on there. But um, there's just tons of emphasis and effort put into getting people to read the Bible. So obviously, a, a, there's a lot of assumed value in reading the Bible. I don't know that we do a very good job of talking a lot or effectively maybe about why. Now I know we do in terms of saying things, you know, we say a little more in depth than this, but we say you should read the Bible, and I think we come to some assumptions about, well, I'm, it teaches us about God, or, you know, this is what Christians do. My question is this today, is, is what is the value? What is the real value of reading the Bible? If, if, you, if we're going to devote all of this money and all of this uh, effort and all of these emphasis to reading the Bible or knowing the Bible, what is the value of it? I mean, what's the really bottom line value of, of reading the Bible regularly? Have you ever nailed down for you the bottom line reason that reading the Bible, learning God's Word is so important? Now, I know that many of you have. I get that. I know this is probably not novel in terms of an idea or a question, but I wonder how much we've actually lingered over that question to get down to a very clear, compelling reason that you read the Bible. I would suggest this. No, no, it's not universally true. But if you struggle to consistently read God's Word and take it in an effective way, in general, that is an indication that you've never answered that question very well. In general, if we, if we wrestle with reading the Bible regularly and taking in that information, then we probably haven't answered the question, what, what is the great value, or what is the greatest value, I should say, of reading the Bible? There are a lot of values. We could, we could assign a lot of uh, terms of value to reading Scripture. But what's the greatest? What's the greatest value of knowing God's Word? What does God's Word say about that? 
in terms of what the greatest value is. So we're going to look today, and James answers the question well. He's d decisive. Maybe one of the reasons we're excited about James is he doesn't mince words. He's very plain spoken. He's very direct. And I think there is in that a lot of value just right there. So we're going to be looking at James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. And I uh, want to read that today. Uh, just, just to begin the, the, the whole message, let's, let's just read that through. And um, however works best for you, whatever works best for you in terms of hearing when I read this, the, the idea is to not just be ritualistic in reading, but to get a big picture before we start breaking it up. All right, so um, today I'm just going to have you stand and we're going to look at verses 19 through 27. Let me read that. If you need to shut your eyes and, and just kind of let it land on you, uh, if you need to just listen for keywords, however you need to do that, feel free to do that. Here's what James chapter 1 verse 19 says. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of a man does not achieve or prove the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face, his physical face, in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, that is scripture, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks of himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, he deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. I told you he was plain spoken. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. God, that's your word, it's your wisdom, it's your power. We throw ourselves at your feet, depending on you, to awaken our souls to hear and to be the doers that James tells us to be. We're depending right now in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Let's look at verses 19 through 20. And, and this is the approach that we're taking. Now, I've done this a little bit before. We break down verses. Uh, but uh, to cover... These, these sections, I'm going to move fairly quickly through these descriptive uh, elements of, of the verses. So the aim here is, there will be times we slow down and look at words and do a little bit more in depth, but the aim here is to get, a, get the bigger narrative, if you will, the bigger concepts out of, these, out of these blocks of verses, and then we'll put all of those together and pull out exactly what the theme that James is saying. There are many things that James says, and anytime you take more than one verse, you, you run the risk or you just give up the option of, of uh, diving into all the possibilities, okay? And that's kind of hard for me because I like to dive into all the possibilities. So just know how we're approaching that, and that'll help you today. So in verses 19 through 20, but you're just going to see where James is coming from. And I think this is very, very important to see his heart, and he shows us his heart. Uh, he calls his readers uh, beloved brethren or dearest brothers. It's, it's another way to hear that. I think that's important. I stuck on that this week because James is blunt. James is matter of fact. I mean, he's just going to hit you between the eyes with kind of truth. And he's not going to make it flowery. He's not going to try to soften the blow. He's not going to try to, to back up from it. He just says what, what is true. And if we hear that wrong, because it's just like when you get a text message or an email and uh, you can't hear the tone that it's delivered in, unless they give you a description of the tone, like saying, I am not angry, or I mean this to be funny. Those are efforts to communicate tone or tenor or your posture in the conversation. James does that. He does it with these words, dearest brothers, my beloved brethren. 
it's important to hear if his affection for these people. And that's all I wanted us to hear today, is that he cares. He's not mad at these people. I mean, when you read some of the stuff we're going to read today, you can think, he's a little bit ticked off at them. I mean, he's just it's like, spiritually, this is a shot between the eyes. It kind of sounds that way, unless you back up and just catch these two words, and he calls them beloved brethren. Now, how would you feel? I know we don't use that language today, but if someone... If my wife were here today, she would tell you that it was one of the things that drew her to the pastor who proclaimed the gospel in a way that she heard and received and, and accepted Christ. That he used beloved a lot. And it just softened her, her receptivity to her, made her softer. And, and so uh, could you hear James today using that phrase? Just, just take it in that he is directly appealing to people with affection and concern and tenderness he's not speaking from some distant emotionally detached place James is speaking from a heart that's filled clearly filled with deep love and tender affection for his readers so take that in today it's going to cause you to hear it differently all right because I have spent a lot of time just thinking of James as kind of avoiding we can avoid James because ah, he didn't leave you any wiggle room I mean he really doesn't he's one of those writers that just I mean you're going to you just have to deal with it kind of thing. And if you hear him as that kind of guy, just deal with it. You know, people like that just say, I'm just going to tell you the truth, and you have to deal with it. And it's like, all right, when you deliver truth to me in that way, I really don't want to hear it because it doesn't sound like you really care about me. You just want to use truth like a blunt force object in my life. Uh, James is, can be misconstrued that way, but that is not him. He is plain spoken, but because he has tender affection. He has deep love, all right? So let's, let's, let's go here to this next. This, we're looking at verses 19 through 20. Knowing is the first step. It's not the destination. That's what he's going to say to us here. Knowing God's word is the first step. It's not the destination. Now, we can all come to the misguided conclusion that knowing God's word is enough uh, and, and feel some kind of spiritual pride about that, like I'm familiar or I know. And, and we've all probably met people who maybe have been these people uh, at times where uh, we, you know, feel proud about our accomplishment of God's word, whether we've memorized it, whether we can quote a new verse, or uh, and all that. And all that that boils down to when we get into that realm is that knowing is the pinnacle, like knowing is the achievement, and knowing God's word is the destination. But James is going to say over and over and over in a lot of different ways that knowing is the first step; it's not the destination. So he starts by telling them they already know these things that he's telling them. They're aware. They have an intellectual grasp of what he's saying. So he's already giving them that. He's saying, uh, beloved brethren, uh, this you know, beloved brethren. I'm not telling you anything new, beloved brethren. You understand. You have grasped. You have an intellectual concept of what we're talking about. So that's an important thing to note. Now, the word know that he used means to see. It means to become aware of or behold something. So he's He's starting where they are. He's just starting right where they are. And, and, and this, this is God's approach to us when it comes to his word, starting where our. are. That's why anybody, the most devout theologian on the world and the, most, the, mo the, the freshest Christian you can think of can all go to John chapter 1 and wait around and, and be moved, or Romans or, or James, because God starts where people are not where you need to be or supposed to be. And so God's word has this unique ability to meet you there regardless. And it's beautiful. It's very, very challenging. You all have experienced that. You know what I'm talking about if you've ever read a scripture and then read it again a year later or 10 years later and go, I never saw that. Never. Well, that's, I get something different. Scripture didn't change. You're just mining the depths of it. And it has, it has beautiful layers that unfold the truth. So he's starting point where they're at, and then he's going to speak to them directly and plainly about the insufficiency, and I think that's a good word, of merely knowing uh, in this way. It's insufficient. It's not wrong. It's just when that becomes the goal, when that becomes the destination, then it's insufficient. So he urges them to let their knowledge to lead them to live differently, and that's really a synopsis of the message today, that the knowledge of God's Word should lead to living differently. 
Okay, so we're going to walk through that because there's a lot in that statement. But that's where he's going. So he, he, he gives them this example. That's why he says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Now, if you just read through James, you can take that like he, James is jumping all over the place here. So we could preach this message that this is a good way to live life. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Uh, slow to anger. And, but it fits in what this is, is, is an example of what he's talking about. It fits in his context of knowing is insufficient alone, that knowing isn't the destination, that knowing is the first step. So he says, there's three things. He says, be eager to hear, quick to hear. Okay, so the, the idea there is simply this, that the starting point for becoming and learning to live like Jesus, the starting point, not the end point, the starting point is to be eager to know it, to have a desire to know it, to understand that we have to take in God's word. It's not just by osmosis that you get it by sitting close to a Bible. It is not just by sitting being present in a congregation where somebody's talking or teaching about God's word or in a small group we have to have a posture or a desire or a position or a condition is the word I'm trying to work my way to a condition of our heart that is eager to know God's word now I'm going to back up and say you will never be eager to know God's word until you know the ultimate value of knowing God's word I think motive matters here I think it is is imperative to get that but what I'm saying to you is he's saying, hey, this is a starting point. Be eager to hear. We have to hear the truth. You have to take it in. It's important to know the Bible. We're not going to diminish that. He says that's fundamental. But he says, then be slow to speak. That it is being more eager to speak than to hear prevents us from ever getting a start on living like Jesus. I am guilty of this one. That is, I can get really excited about a truth that God reveals to me and then I want to spout it out I just want to tell other people about it my motives are good that is I like what I've heard and taken in but then I preach it prematurely or I or I talk about it too much and I've not let it saturate my soul I've not let it come deep within me I've not really wrestled with it and so James is saying, hey, hey, when you take in God's word, when you begin to know it, it's going to be, but don't just go, don't just turn around and say, hey, look what I learned. Spend some time with it. Be slow to speak it back. That's not the important part in this process right now. The important part is to let it sink deep. Now, if you're going to go water your garden this afternoon, and that'd be a good idea if you have a garden, except you got to do it either before the car show or after the car show. That's an art form to learn how to plug an event in the middle of a sermon and be on track. If you're going to water your garden, sometimes it can cause me to lose where I was, but I didn't this time, so ha. Huh. Uh, if you're going to water your garden, the best thing to do is what? Turn on a, a fire hose and just go whoosh at once and get it done. That's what I like to do when I was a kid. But my dad always let me water the garden because I like to send in the door of my of our, our garage which led to our garden and pretend like I was a fireman and I was putting out fire uh, he may have given me that idea to manipulate me into water in the garden but I, I had fun either way but the key to water in your garden is to low, water it slowly so the water sinks in right if you do it all at once you can do this water in a plant if you water your plant and you just dump in a bunch of water what happens a lot of it just runs right through and just runs out have you ever done that Maybe you water a plant on their kitchen table and you pour the water in too fast and it just ends up on your table because it comes out the hole in the bottom. But notice this. If you water it slowly, if you pour in a little water and let that soil absorb that water and you pour in a little more water, you can pour in the same amount of water and it won't run on your table. It depends on the speed that you deliver the water with because it's got to give time for the, the soil to absorb the moisture. When you dump it all in, it just runs through. It doesn't have time. And I, I want to suggest to you that that's what James is saying about being slow to speak. Take it in. Don't just, don't just regurgitate it. Let it sink in slowly. And, and, and also I would say to you that many times when we're trying to approach God's word in this way, that less is more. That is to read less scripture more slowly than more scripture quickly. Okay? So then he goes to this. He says slow to anger. Now this sounds 
strange. This sounds like, how are you going to fit this into this whole topic of knowing and doing? But listen, the word for anger is interesting. And this is where it does do some value. There is some value in doing a word study because when I say uh, you be slow to anger, what do you think? Somebody tell me, what, slow to, what's that mean? Yeah, slow to get mad. Don't get mad quickly. Now, what if I were to tell you that's not really what James is talking about? Because I'm going to tell you, that's not really what James is talking about. It can mean, that it can mean to be angry, okay? The word can mean that. I, I'm not going to say it can't mean that. But when you put it into the context and you understand the, the original meaning and the, and the alternative meanings, um, it, the word is arge. It's actually spelled O-R-G-E. You can see, because we have younger people in here, some derivatives of that word. One primarily that we won't talk about necessarily in mixed company, but here's what the word arge means. It means to speak, it means desire as in an excited condition. Desire is an excitedly reaching out or an excited state of mind. That's what, now it can lead to anger. That can be descriptive of being angry. But I think when you put it in the context of everything that James is saying, he is talking more about being slow to take God's word and impulsively react to it with excitement. He's not, otherwise, this is just a random thought that James fits in. And while I do that quite frequently in my conversations with people, I don't think James is doing that. I don't think he's saying, hey, here's just a way to live life. And we can interpret that. Hey, be, uh, be slow to speak, quick, or eager to listen to people, don't talk a lot, and just don't get angry quick. And that's good advice. I think it's biblical, but I don't think that's the whole message here. I think he's talking about how to take in God's Word slowly, deliberately, let it saturate your soul, and then it will naturally have the effect that it needs to have. All right? So he's telling them not to respond impulsively, not to let their uninformed thoughts get them so excited that they jump the gun and act in ignorance. Now, I've, I, I'm just telling you I'm not very far down the road on this. Because when I get excited about something I've read or something I've learned or something God shows me, the first thing I want to do as a pastor, as a preacher, as a communicator is to tell you. I, I, I want to share that from the pulpit. But again, this is the value of, if you were here during our transition from, from I don't know what form of leadership we had before now, but now we have this, our elder uh, form of leadership, that they've spoken into my life and said, slow down. One in particular has spoken in my life said, slow down. Let that sink in. You can preach that, but just not yet. So the whole of what he's saying here is about a, it's a way of living our lives and approaching God's Word, not just a pragmatic, here's how to have relationships, or it's a listening and a hearing well and being patient and thoughtful when it comes to our response to God's Word. So why is this important? He answers that question. Why is it important? In verse 20. In verse 20, he says very clearly, look at verse 20 with me. Just look there real quick. If you can find it, I'll find it. He says, For the anger of a man does not achieve the righteousness of God. That fits with anger as in mad, but it also fits very, I think, more appropriately even with the concept that we're talking about. Don't be impulsive and, and reactive and, 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 and shallow in our understanding because that doesn't lead us to the life of righteousness that God has for us. Because what's the scripture say also about anger? This is one of the reasons we know we're misinterpreting it when we just use it to be mad. The scripture says, be angry, but do not sin. Anger is really, as in being angry, the inevitable response to things. It's going to make you angry if I come up and kick you in the shin. Now, what you do with that is, is the important thing. So I think that James is speaking less in that context and more in the context of, hey, uh, let me tell you what I just learned yesterday. Uh, that can be fine as long as you're not letting that usurp you, uh, your process of taking it in and letting it sink in and moving forward. So why is this important? He says because living with life with impulsive, thoughtless actions, especially in regard to God's word, it doesn't lead to living life with God for the good of others. It doesn't lead. If you live that way, if you're constantly taking it in just this deep and responding to it, this deep and moving on, it never saturates your soul. It never sinks in very deep. So look at verse 21. He says, therefore, okay, you've heard this before, but anytime you see the word therefore, you should look and see what it's there for. That is, it's connecting the previous thought to the, the coming thought. 
He said, because that is true, we're going to put aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, and in humility, receive the word implanted. So you hear the tone in humility, in gentleness, in a posture of, of openness and eagerness. Take the word of God into you that's implanted, which is able to save your souls. Not just, and I'm so glad that Courtney sang the song that we sang, uh, Heaven is Here, because uh, when you hear able to save your souls, a lot of times we think, hey, I... The, the word of God is going to tell me how to get saved so when I die I go to heaven yes that would be this deep of an understanding of what it means to save your soul uh, saving your soul would mean to be redeemed into a relationship with God and right standing with God that is now and forever but beginning here and now that's what he means the, the, this word can bring us into right relationship with God here and now what is our mission our mission as a church is to learn to do life with God in community and that's what he means that's what we mean I should say when we talk about learning to do life with God that is the the descriptive phrase save your soul we are redeeming our soul learning to live life in the kingdom here and now so the first action step that we should take in practice is setting aside patterns of living that we know don't fit the new life God has for us. That's a pretty simple action step. And, and usually we don't need a specific verse to tell us what those things are, right? If you're a violent person and you're getting in fights in a drunken rage every weekend, you probably don't need a scripture to indicate that's not a good way to live. If you're stealing on a regular basis from whatever entity, you probably don't need the scripture that says do not steal. It's one of the commandments, right? So in respect, if you do, that's fine. Need the, the scripture for that. But it's the first. It's saying, I don't want these anymore. I want a different way to live. So verse 22, he says what? But prove, instead of just put all that stuff, let go of it. It's not the life that you want. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. And prove, uh, prove the word that he uses right there, the second word, means uh, for something to come into existence. It doesn't mean to argue your case. It means uh, do something in such a way that something else comes into existence. So you hear, hear how he's saying that? When he says prove yourselves, he says live as doers of the word and you'll see, you'll prove, you'll demonstrate the reality and the effectiveness of the word. So it means to begin, it can mean to begin to be also. Prove, begin to be a doer of the word. Practice being a doer of the word. It, it's a person who performs the word, actually. The doer is the word, it really is a word where we get actor from. And it talks about acting out or performing the word. So you get, you get the script, quote-unquote, right? And then you take the script and you begin to act that out. Now, in a dramatic sense, that's we're acting something that is maybe not real or we're performing in something that's not, not real life. But James is using that in the context that we are taking the script and we're performing it, we're doing it. So he says, be a doer in this way, not merely a hearer, not just a hearer. The word merely means only or solo, don't just be a hearer. Because what could we do any of this if you weren't a hearer? So don't, let's not go backwards and say, well, hearing God's word is not important. We just got to do it. Well, you can't do what you don't know, right? So he says, don't only, don't merely, don't just be one person who hears or takes in the God, God's word. Become a person whose knowledge of God's word, and I'm not talking about a knowledge of the original languages, I'm not talking about that, but your familiarity with the message of Jesus leads to doing leads to doing what the word teaches us to do. As opposed, as opposed in contrast to the one who is only a hearer of the word, all right? Have you ever had someone sit and listen to you share something that you're certain? You just you just know by experience. Could be a parent to a child, could be friend to friend. But you share something you know would help them in a significant way. But you know they're never going to do what you say. They hear you all day long. This is very common in parent-child relationships. <laughs> They'll hear you all day long. But they are not intending to do what they hear. Again, the correlation is clear. 
Let's not sit under the counsel of God's word, James says, dearly be uh, beloved brethren. Let's not sit under the counsel of God's word and pretend like we know best. That we'll placate God by hearing or taking in God's word, but have no intention to adjust our lives to reflect that hearing. That's what James said in verse 22. But look at verses 23 and 24. He says, For anyone, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man, or like a woman, or like a teenager, who looks at his natural face in a mirror, your physical face, for once he has, and you could connect these thoughts by saying, and once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was, what he saw. So like looking in a mirror and forgetting what, what you look like. So here's a word picture. It's, it's a, he's descriptive that, to help us see the truth about a person who is only a hearer of the word and not a doer. So he uses a, an analogy that we can really relate to today. So it, it's like a person who, who goes up to a mirror, clearly sees their face in a mirror. You did this this morning probably. If you didn't, you might have some self-esteem issues that you need to check out. Uh, there are people that just don't want to look in a mirror. I understand that. But uh, looked in the face in the mirror, and then as soon as you walk away, that person totally forgets what they saw and came to know about what they look like. So think about this real quick. What is the purpose of looking in a mirror? To see, let's just say, to see the real condition of your face. Okay, you can kind of see the condition of your clothing. You can't see the back, but mirrors don't help you there anyway. Once you're over 40, you can't turn around to see that. So if you just look in a mirror, maybe you're checking your teeth. Maybe if, if, if you're a woman, and I will say this, if you're a woman, you're checking your makeup. If you're a guy, you shouldn't be doing that. I'm just saying. <laughs> Call me traditional. <laughs> if you are wearing makeup as a guy, you probably should check it. Okay, all right. Maybe you have reasons. I don't know. I digress. So you look at your face to see. Now, when I was 18, I looked at my face to see if there was a pimple somewhere that I didn't really want a pimple to be, although the information didn't lead to anything but anxiety because I couldn't do anything about the pimple. Today, I might look in the mirror to see if one of my 48-year eyebrows is just radically out of control, which sometimes happens, and that's way more information than you want to know, but I'm an open book. Aren't you glad? <laughs> not so much. <laughs> Notice my wife is not here. <laughs> I don't want to know. The point is, if you looked in the mirror and you had broccoli for lunch and you smile and see a big old green thing of broccoli stuck between your front teeth and just went about your business, well, that would be kind of foolish, wouldn't it? I mean, you looked in the mirror to see the reality, and you're supposed to react to the reality that you see in the mirror. That is, remove the broccoli if you see the broccoli. Please, for, for the sake of God, remove the broccoli for everybody else that's got to see you. I mean, zip your zipper. Uh, button your buttons. Does that drive you crazy? You walk around, I do this, so it drives. But, you know, in someone's shirts like this, because they button, you know, the wrong. Don't you want to just go up? Maybe it's just me, and just go, can I fix your shirt? Did you... You st those, but you probably shouldn't go unbutton somebody's shirt that didn't ask you to do that, so don't do that part. But the point is, look in the mirror and adjust, react. So he's saying it's like that. To look into the mirror of God's Word and not to react to it is just kind of, can I use the word stupid? I mean, just not make any sense at all. Why look at it? Why look at yourself in the mirror in the morning if you're not going to react to what? Why did you look in the first place? Maybe, maybe you were looking for affirmation of what you already thought was reality. And you look in the mirror just to see that you're a beautiful person. And you just have a self-admiration moment where you're saying, look at that face, man. I can't wait to show this to everybody today. And I'm just looking forward to smiling. And I'm going to bless people with this. I'm just going to go around and bless people all day long. And maybe you were looking at that for that reason. And I say that, but I'm going to tell you something. People do that with God's word. Let me see how good I am. Wow, I, I am, well, let's just shut that and move on. Don't do that. If you've got broccoli in your teeth spiritually, let's get that out. Let's, let's, let's move on. Let's respond to the truth that, 
you've seen in the mirror. And that's what James is saying over and over. Respond to the truth. Don't just know the truth. Respond to the truth. And don't just take in the information. Adjust to it. So in verse 25, he says, the one who looks intently. So this is in contrast to what we just saw. The one who looks intently at the perfect law. Another word of God's word, okay? The perfect law. The law of liberty. So he describes it. And I think intentionally so. And they look at the perfect law. The law of liberty, and then there's a key word here, and abides by it. Not having become a forgetful hearer that walks off with broccoli in their teeth, but an effectual doer, the smart person who removes the broccoli that they saw, this man, this woman, will be blessed in what he or she does. It turns our attention to what we can do and what it should be like, right? So he envisions a person who looks intently at God's word. Notice that word looks intently. It's an important word. It describes someone who is physically bent over, actually, peering into something with great interest. I, I hate bending over. I don't know why. You can. There's lots of possible reasons, but I do not like. If I'm bending over looking at something, I'm pretty doggone interested. Let me just say that. And I'm even more interested if I bend over and linger there. First of all. I got to digress just a second, but when I went and got my physical, and the doctor looked at my BMI, your body mass index, I was dangerously close to obese, technically, and that is a sobering thought to hear, and it relates because when I bend over, it gets harder to breathe, all right, so she might have a point there, so if I'm bent over, and <laughs> just keep coming with me, I didn't take my medicine, all right, if, if I bend over here, and I'm looking into something. If you saw somebody doing this, and they're bent over, and they're just looking, because this is the word, right? Looking intently. This is, this is the Greek uh, meaning behind this, all right? This is what it describes, the posture that you're looking. If you saw somebody doing this in a parking lot, and they're looking maybe down in a culvert, or they're looking under a car, and they don't just go like this and up, but they just stay down here, right? And they're looking... And maybe they get on their hands and knees and they get closer. That's what he's saying about how we look at God's Word. It's pretty cool, huh? I mean, the descriptiveness versus he could have just said, hey, if you read God's Word slowly and take it in, but he describes that. He says, you're looking, remind yourself, you're looking what? At the law of liberty. This is not a law that binds us. He's not talking about this is not to, so we learn the rules and stay in the rules and so we can live an imprisoned life into the morality of God that we don't like but He likes. He said, no, this is the law of liberty. This stuff brings freedom. Don't be afraid to peer into it. Don't be afraid to linger over it and take in the truth and the reality. I mean, if it says it's got broccoli between your trees, everybody agrees we should get the broccoli out. If God's word shows you truth about yourself, man, we should agree and know that God knows how to live life, and he wants us to become the people that he has designed for us to be. Not just moral religious robots for his pleasure alone, but people designed to live and become like Jesus, peer long and hard into the law of liberty. It's the perfect law, and it brings freedom of life. And nothing else can do that. So he says this, the outcome of peering into, lingering over God's word, taking it to heart, and living in light of it is absolutely beautiful. And it describes what everybody is looking for. Something more desirable than more people people will ever realize. He says it simply. Not flowers, not a bunch of descriptive adjectives. He just says, when you, do, when you, when you bend over and look like that, when you peer, when you linger, that person will be blessed in what they do. Now the shallow understanding would be, if you do what God's word says... God will be happy with you, and you'll be happy because God is happy with you. That's really not what he's saying. Well, I guess you could... Well, if you just want to stay an inch deep, maybe. But what he's really saying is when you look into the law of liberty, you look at the book of life, when you linger over it, it's going to say, here is the life I made you to live. And when you live that life, you will find fortune and joy and peace and contentment and satisfaction and hope and enriched relationships and transformation of your soul you will be blessed for what you do 
that's a lot different than, God, if I follow the rules, will you give me a toy? God, if I follow the rules well, will you be happy and not mad? No, the blessedness comes. and God delights in our obedience. Delights. But not because he's a moral policeman. Because he's your heavenly father. And he knows it's the life. So when you choose to live outside the scope of that, you are choosing to live a less than life. I mean, there's no way, ifs, ands, or buts about that. I mean, you choose to live life on your own scope of, of, of will. Say, well, God, I know you said this, but I'm going to do this. God will allow you to do that, but you need to know what you're doing is you're moving away from the law of liberty into the law of bondage and sin, and the wages of sin is what? Death. The, the wages of the law of liberty is what? Freedom and bless. So we just need to put all that together and go, wow, God's, God's really in this for my good and his glory. Absolutely, every single time. Verses 26 through 27. If anyone, anyone thinks of himself to be religious but, and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man, religion, is worthless. All right, walk with me through this. We're going to do this. This is very, very good. Pure, and then he goes, pure and undefiled religion. What did he just describe? Worthless religion. So now he says, pure and undefiled religion. That's the contrast. Worthless versus pure and undefiled religion. Religion is not a set of belief systems like we would think of religion. It's a way of living life oriented to God. So pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God, the one that God says, this is right, and God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Now, we would do ourselves a great disservice if we said, hey, if we're going to be real serious Christians, we need to start visiting orphans and widows every single day, all of you. And you say, well, I'm a widow. Who do I visit? You just hang out with you. That's not what he's saying, right? It's not what he's saying. Now, I think he means that. That was a real population of people, orphans and widows. Now, notice he tags something to the end of that, in their distress. But what he's describing are people who are left out, left behind, who don't have an advocate, who are suffering the most in society, who have the hardest road to hoe, who have the most pain to deal with, who have no one backing them. Pure religion is not to look and know what God's Word, it's to look and do what God's Word says. And if you just follow Jesus around through the Scriptures, you see him hanging out with these people a lot. It was his M.O., he developed a reputation for it. Not just orphans and widows. He didn't just stay there. He hung out with drunk people and prostitutes too. You're Jesus. Why? They were the outcasts. They were the tax collectors. Everybody hated. He said, pure religion, real religion, doers of God's word are going to be with broken people. They're not going to just comfort themselves and isolate themselves with upper middle class or, or socioeconomic equals. They're going to, to wade into the lives of people who are broken. He says, I think the, the, the profound thing that James is hitting right on the head is saying, if you want to know God's word, the great value of it is going to lead you to do it. And, and, the, and the tenor of your life is going to be you're going to step into these kind of people's lives. Because what did Jesus do? Hey, did you know Jesus is not an upper middle class white guy? Did you know that? that? That he's not like you. He really is better than you. Did you know he stepped down to get into your world and mine? Did you know he left glory and went into a train wreck, a trash heap? He says, if you're going to follow me, you become like me. And if you're going to become like me, you're going to do this. You're going to step into other people's lives. And it's not pretty, but it's beautiful. It's not going to make you rich, but you're going to be more wealthy than you've ever been. This kind of religion is not merely known. It's not intellectual in nature. It's visible. And it looks like this, looking after those among you, around you, who have no one else really looking after them and caring for them. And that could take you into the sex trafficking world that is being exposed on a radical level and even in Topeka, Kansas. It could take you to it could take you to the nursing home with Bill. It could 
take you next door to a widow. It could take you to McClure to sit with a kid at lunch who doesn't have a, a male role model. It could take you a lot of places, but I promise you, it's going to take you someplace. To be a doer of God's word is not about becoming all clean and tidy and righteous selfishly. It's actually about getting your hands dirty and living life like Jesus lived life. So, to take all that and boil it down, the message is this. The great value of knowing God's Word is that in knowing it, we can do it. Just know what that looks like, all right? It's beautiful. Honestly, it's, it's beautiful. So, Here's what I want to do. I was going to walk a little bit more through that James Mirror illustration, but I encourage you to do that on your own. And understand this real quick. I've got to say this. The one thing a mirror does is it allows you to see the parts of you that you don't see yourself, and that is true of God's Word. You're just not going to see. When you look into God's Word, it's going to expose the parts of you, reveal the parts of you that you just don't look at you don't see and if you just by the way if you are one of the people and I'm talking literally that, that just avoids mirrors because you don't like what you see maybe you've gotten older than you really want to admit maybe you've gained more weight than you really want to see maybe you don't like something about you so you just avoid the truth hey I, I honestly don't care if you look in a mirror not a physical one but I, there are people doing that spiritually Lots of people doing this spiritually. You don't want to look in God's Word because they're afraid that they're going to feel guilty. They're afraid they're going to feel shame. They're afraid they're going to feel beat down. They're afraid they're going to see stuff they just can't do anything about. So why look at it anyway? But that's a lie. Well, it's not totally a lie because you maybe not. You can't do anything about your heart. But Jesus can. If you linger there, He's going to transform you why Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God, listen to it in light of what we said. Please listen to it in light of what we said. For the Word of God is what? Alive and active. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Cutting, listen close, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. What's it doing? It's exposing our innermost thoughts and desires. Why? Just to make you feel guilty? No, to say, here's the problem. And here's the life you can have. God will never point out the broken parts without a pathway to redemption. So, here's what I want you to do. Here's my challenge. I want you to, this week, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really challenge you to do this. This is an easy thing for me to do. That is, I can just sit here and, and say, this is how we want to close up the sermon. But I don't want to do this. I'm going to ask you to take this really, really seriously, okay? Really, really seriously. I worked hard on this. Not just this, but this message, and because it, it matters, and I feel like it's timely and it's significant, and I want you to take this to heart. Or do yourself a favor and just say, hey, I have no interest. I'm not even going to pretend. But here it is. I want you to come up with a plan that would allow you to read the book of Colossians. You could pick another book if you want, but this is a good one to do this with. It's short enough to do it. It's deep enough. To, they're all deep, but it's four chapters long. And you can divide it up however works best for you. You can read a chapter a day. You can make it work out for five days, seven days. I don't, I don't care. But before you read it each day, I want you to do something. I want you to read Hebrews 4.12, the one we just read. All right, I want you to take that in, okay? The Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing thoughts and intentions. It's revealing your soul. You might want to read that in the message again. Not, I mean, understand what it's really saying, but the message is, has, a, has a good paraphrase that helps you... Get, take in uh, the message. But read that and read it slowly and thoughtfully. Take that in. And then I want you to read whatever section of Scripture you've chosen to read from Colossians. I think it would be cool if we all did Colossians, by the way. I just think that would be, it, there's something about the unity there that will be valuable. But as you read, I want you to notice, read differently this time. I want you to read with a mind to notice the broccoli between your teeth. I keep saying that because I'm trying to drive home a point, okay? And I know you'll remember crazy things. If he kept saying broccoli, but what's that mean? That means noticing stuff about you that you really don't like. 
It really doesn't feel good. You really don't want exposed. Notice that stuff. Let God's Word do that to you. Don't just read it for information. Don't just read it to say you read it. Don't just read it so you can say you did your devotion. Read it like a mirror and let it speak the truth to your life and expose the broken wreck that we all are in places of our lives. And at the end of the reading of Colossians, after you do that for four days, five days, seven days, I want you to just pick one thing. It would be good if you, the real challenge would be write that down. Write one thing down a day that you can think of. Maybe, maybe the same thing day one and day two and day three. That's fine. But write something down that's exposed. Something about you that you know is not in sync with God. That is not the life, not the character, not the heart, not the soul condition that God wants for you. No, write it down. And at the end of the reading, I want you to, 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 to pick something. One of them, one of the things that was exposed. I don't want you to do this on a daily basis. We'll never do that. But you pick one thing at the, at the end of the, of the reading and say, this is something I want God to change. I, it's truth. It's reality. Here's who I am. Here's who I need to be. God, you have to do that work. I want to learn to live my life like Jesus. So the first thing you're going to do is adjust your life. That's getting rid of all the moral filth and wickedness, right? So you see something about yourself in Colossians that you know is not right, then you reject. Let's just say you just found out that you have hate in your heart for somebody. And you say, all right, I reject that. I don't know necessarily how to get rid of it, deal with it, but I just reject that. I'm verbally, I'm positionally, I'm everything, I'm rejecting that. Now I'm going to put myself in a position so that God can change that about me. It is no different than laying down on the table for surgery and saying, I can't fix this. They took a rib out and put a stent in my shoulder. I couldn't have done that to myself. I had to lay down and literally submit people I'd ever met before or since. But I trusted them. I couldn't fix myself. And I'm telling you, you can't fix yourself. But you can lay down before God in a position that He can. And this is where you implement a spiritual discipline, a practice. A practice is an important word of doing something that helps you practice doing life like Jesus has prescribed so that in the practicing you are obedient to Jesus and in obedience to Jesus we become like Jesus. We're transformed. We don't stay the same. So I, I have all that written down but if you want help finding a spiritual discipline and coming up with something that would address your issue I'm just going to make myself available. I, may, I wish I had this problem. I hope I have this problem that, you know, I get 30 emails on Wednesday or Thursday or Friday, and I, I can't do it all. I can't come up with all that, so I have to call a deacon here and an elder there and say, I need you to help this person. I, I want, they need some help figuring out how they can implement a spiritual discipline to address this issue in their life. Do you know what would happen in our church family? Listen, I, I know, I know, you know, maybe my faith is small, but I know there's a significant number of people that are never going to go this far, never going to do this. But I'm going to ask you to, nonetheless, and I'm telling you, I'm asking with an expectation that you do it. Because think of this, just think of this, and I'm closing. I know this is long, just stay with me. What would happen in this church and in our lives if we did this? What would happen next week? Next week, if everybody adjusted their life, even incrementally, to be more obedient to God on purpose. Now I'm telling you, the gates of hell would tremble. I'm telling you that darkness in our lives would be vanquished. We would be amazed at what a small step would accomplish when you're stepping toward Jesus. We would be shocked. I dare you. I double dog dare you. I triple dog dare you. Does it go beyond triple dog? Quadruple dog? Is that where you get your tongue stuck on the light pole? I'm daring you. You're not going to get your tongue. You will get your tongue lit up if you lick a light pole in June right now. But hey, if that helps you remember to do this, lick away. Knock yourself out. It's that important. It's that important. Pray with me. Jesus, we are dearly beloved children. You're not scolding us today. 
You've called us to your lap. You've put your arm around us. And with greatest love and compassion known in the universe, your eyes have met ours. And you have gently, clearly stated this truth. There's a better way. That you have a better life. And you really, truly, deeply desire for us to enter that life. And you've made it far more simple than we've ever imagined. So help us to engage. Jesus, we can't do it without you. We can't do it without you. It's simply impossible. But we can do what you said, that is to linger, to bend over and look long and hard in your word. And that's the great value is it leads to a transformed way of living, not just being. So we're going to trust you to work great things at Covenant Baptist Church, not so that we can brag, so that we can declare an unblemished, glorious, and radiant gospel to people who are hurting and broken. Give us that opportunity, even today, with people who are going to come on a hot June afternoon and just look at cool cars. Would you help us to be the church you've called us to be? We pray in Jesus' name.